Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, we're thrilled today to kick off uh, the third year of Bright Lights Green Sites series with um, an incredible guest, Leo Sardina, who's the founder of Haku, and also a good friend of mine that uh, we figured out today we first met 10 years ago. So it's been amazing to watch Leo's journey over the past few years, um, and we're excited to hear from him today. We're going to kick off before Leo comes up uh, with a short video that is going to describe a little bit about Haku's work. Um, and then and the floor will be yours, Leo. Oh. <laughs> this was your job, <laughs> We are the alternative. As indigenous women, as artisans, as mothers, as guardians of the forest and ancestral knowledge. We are the alternative to fossil fuels and deforestation. The word Haku in Quechua means let's go. It's an encouragement saying, let's go forward. This is why the Haku project aims to challenge the current economic situation in our communities. Through our craft, jewelry and pottery, we say, let's go forward. Let's recognize the important role of women in our indigenous communities. Let's generate sustainable alternative income so that our planet don't have to go back to fossil fuels and deforestation. Let's embrace our traditional art forms and techniques, and in that way, we can defend our territories and our planet. Yeah. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So this is... <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Leo, Leo Cerda. I'm from Ecuador. I'm really excited to be here and share the story of Haku. Um, we basically just started uh, a year ago. October last year, I decided to quit my job. <laughs> so um, um, the story of Haku is that we believe that community-based alternative projects are the best way to fight against fossil fuel extraction, deforestation in the Amazon. Um, uh, me and my co-founder, Nina, we're both Quechua from the Ecuadorian Amazon. We've, um, uh, we've been working with indigenous communities for like the past decade, doing like activism work, uh, supporting our communities fight against fossil fuel extraction, oil companies, doing marches, strikes, demonstrations, a lot of that as part of this activism journey that we had like growing up. I, um, I remember when I was like 12 years old, I found out like how other indigenous people in the upper Amazon uh, lived and how their lands and territories were destroyed by their oil companies in, uh, in the late 60s when Ecuador first uh, started drilling oil from the Amazon. So once you start drilling oil from the Amazon, there are many, many impacts. There are like social impacts, environmental impacts, and people get dependent. And a lot of the money uh, from the resources that come out from the Amazon, they're not invested back in the communities. And these communities are let uh, abandoned and destroyed and with uh, health um, impacts so that a lot of like the cancer rates are like super high and people depend on their land so the, the, the their farming is already poisoned. So a lot of the, this I learned when I was like 12 years old. Whereas where I lived, it was like, uh, like you see in movies, it was like precious, we had rivers, we like could wander around the, the our, our territory, like swim in the river, hang out with our friends. But when we find that, when I found out that this had happened up, up north, and there were like older kids my age actually going through these horrors of uh, fossil fuel extraction, uh, I decided that I want to be involved, you know, in a way that I can support my community and I support like my family to don't go through this impact. The same as Nina, my, uh, my co-founder, Nina is, um, she's from the Sarayaku community. The Sarayaku community uh, fought uh, an oil company that um, was trying to get into their territory. They sued them through uh, the International uh, Court of Human Rights and they won the case in 2011. And for the, the first time in, uh, for an indigenous community, they say a precedent for 
against the government because they won the case and they said like, for if you want to extract oil from our communities, you have to do um, free private informed consent processes, the due processes before extracting any fossil fuels from an indigenous territory. <coughs> Um, the problem that, um, so the story of Habku starts like that. Yeah, we've been uh, activists and, um, and we thinking about like, yeah, being an activist is like the best way to defend our communities, but a lot of the time you face fossil fuel extraction, deforestation, clearing the pasture, uh, which at the end of the day will devastate the, the Amazon but how can you create an alternative solution? Instead, like, we do advocacy, but a lot of the, the, the communities, uh, a lot of the people, when they confront like oil companies and the fossil fuel industry, they are forced to move out, to move out from their territories to the cities and, and, in order to find jobs, uh, send their kids to school, have better access to the basic sanitation. Because these communities that are in the middle of the Amazon, the government don't even give them basic, uh, th doesn't even cover their basic necessities as Ecuadorians. And um, so a lot of these families are forced out of their communities. And when they are, when they are forced out of their communities, their lands are stay unprotected. And by being unprotected, the oil companies come, they just drill the oil, and we, are, we lose our lands and territories as well as our culture. Because once you're in the city, you're forced to like, speak uh, Spanish, you're very uh, westernized. You know, you're westernized and you go to the last um, step of the, of the, of society, you know, because you don't have the same access that uh, city kids have. So you go to like the poorer areas, the, you don't really have like a good access to education, sanitation, you just going to be like one of the uh, poorest uh, people in like this society in the city. And then you don't have access to your land so you can not uh, grow your own food, you cannot, um, live a community life, which is one of the most important things for us as indigenous, like the way we live in our communities, the way we interact with our families, the way we see culture is very different as the way you're raised in the city. So we saw this problem and then we, uh, we decided to, what is the, what could, what, if, uh, we, we, we started thinking if is there a solution to this kind of problems. And we're not saying that they, like, when, when you saw the videos, like, oh, we're all the alternative. But we think that there are many alternatives towards uh, as being a solution for indigenous people that live in, in, uh, in the Amazon. So we think that we, Right now, due to climate change and the catastrophes and everything that what, what we are seeing, we're trying to we we, we started speaking about um, energy solutions. You know, and I think energy solutions are one key factor towards this new society that we want to build. But there's an interesting thing. You know, there's a percentage like indigenous people represent four percent of the world's population. Four, you know. And uh, our forests around the world that are uh, in hands of indigenous people represent 70% of the forest of the world. So we might be doing something good, you know, so if we, if we take that into account. So how, if we're talking about like the devastation of the planet and climate change, how can we support now these indigenous people that have been preserving the forests of the world? So I think we should start thinking about possible solutions. And the first thing that we start think, uh, that should start thinking is like energy solutions. How can we go beyond fossil fuel extraction? The second thing is that how we give these people in the Amazon the resources to live in their communities, the, the, to support them to stay there. Because a lot of the time they have to go and then 
the, the foresters uh, are, are destroyed. So um, we think that Haku is, is it's, it's a beginning. It's the beginning of an alternative because these communities need income. And what a better way to create sustainable income in which um, the women can work on handcrafts and like work at their houses with their children when they have time, you know, and they don't have to leave out and they can get access to income. So, but Haku is just one of the, like the, the Haku Amazon design is the, the, the project that we created with the women. So we decided that we wanna work with um, uh, several communities and, uh, and train and give uh, and do capacity building so they can do their own handcrafts at their time. But this project comes from, a, from like a, a bigger perspective, a bigger point. Uh, my friend Nina and I created the Haku project. So um, we think that there are like two paradigms in, in, uh, in, um, in life. The first paradigm is where we used to live as indigenous people in our communities, in connection with our lands and territories, protecting the planet, and then there's the, the second stage of the planet. The second paradigm is what capitalism was integrated into our societies and, and into the world. And we have seen what capitalism has done to the world. You know, the structure of resources, we're devastating nature. So what is the third thing that we wanna do? So that, uh, to break this, and create this like third paradigm is we as civil society, as a civil society movement, should start thinking about a possible solution and how we see this new world. So this new world should come from different perspectives. Like if we think about energy solutions, like what is that we are doing towards energy solutions? If we, if we wanna work on, uh, on projects, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm a business person, and how can we do like social innovation? you know, towards combating like poverty. So we, if we all, like, if society start thinking, thinking towards that new world that we wanna live in, we, we can start thinking on the possible solutions. So now we decided that for us, for our communities, the best way to integrate our efforts is to work in four different areas. So we work on education, we're not like, we're, we don't have like huge program, but we say like we need to work in four different things. So the first thing being education, the second thing being health, community health. The third thing is community-based alternative projects, which is Haku Amazon design, because we wanna be self-sustainable and run autonomously. We don't wanna depend on the government, we don't wanna depend on a third party. We just wanna create our, our thing and then from the income that we receive from the projects that, are, that we are doing, we will fund the rest of the projects. And the fourth thing is being advocacy, because without advocacy and um, the protection of in, uh, advocacy and conservation, without that, we will not protect our territories and we won't have a planet to live in anyways. So um, but with Haku Amazon Design, we wanna, we wanna pro provide a unique opportunity to the families to generate income and live in the community as being part of this, this, new pro this new paradigm of this new world that we wanna live in. So we started like the market size, like what is, like talking, talking business now, like what is the market size? How can this project be a reality in, in the world that we currently live in? So the global jewelry market is $310 billion a year. So how can we get a piece of the, of the cake, you know, when we first started doing that? And, that, and there is a growing trend for handmade goods and jewelry. You know, we have Etsy, we have like several markets that concentrate on this artisanal product. And we did the market validation. We just started, we started in May. And this is our fluctuations, you know, of, of, the, uh, of Haku sales. The, the, the first month was okay, August, August was the highest, and September was, was the lowest. So right now, we just finished our first semester, and we are taking consideration what, what are the, like, the market trends, what is, that, is it that we're doing 
good? What is it that we're doing bad? We launch our first collection on May 12th. You know, we work with, um, we work the, with the indigenous communities uh, for the past uh, nine months. We like been creating capacity, doing the workshops, working with uh, jewelry designers, uh, taking into account colors and patterns and techniques, and working with like, we, right now we have um, worked with more than 200 women across the Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. They are from different communities and from different ethnic groups. Um, this is our website. We launched our online platform on May 12th, and we are doing online sales. This is the, the these are the, the designs and the, and the products that we sell. We, you can pay on like, uh, with your credit card or PayPal, and our business model, you know. Uh, we're doing uh, commerce and retail. We're trying to get, we're trying to turn one time sale into multiple sales with the customer. We're just learning about that, you know, we're in, in this process of learning, we're in this process of being part of this social business uh, companies. And like, how do we do it? How do we work with community? So the, 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 the things that are, the three key points of what we want to accomplish as Hack was like, we want projects that can be fair trade, you know, we want our projects to be like fair trade and, and indigenous uh, managed, and that can contribute to conservation of, the, of our forests. Um, our progress, um, we've been, uh, as I said before, we work with more than 200 women that have capacity to make the, the, the um, artisans and, and jewelry that we are, we're selling. We work currently with 60 women on a current basis, and then we have 200 women that we overall have generated capacity with. Uh, our first collection we launched on May 5th with 37 products. Now we have more than, uh, less than 50, more than 40. <laughs> 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 we just launched new products recently, so I don't know that. So, and we have partnerships. We've been creating partnerships. Since Nina and I have been working with different environmental groups, like we still are doing, we, we are still doing our advocacy work for the communities, but, and then we're launching also our product line as, a, as an alternative way. So we've been working with Amazon Watch, with Rainforest Action Network, with Lush Cosmetics, with um, getting, trying to get celebrity sponsors. We, we met with Leo DiCaprio last, last May in, at the March. I knew he was here two weeks ago. <laughs> Somebody asked that to me. I was like, oh, yeah, it's not that he's my bestie, but you know, <laughs> I, I spoke to him. I was like, I, I was pitching him Haku, and he said, like, great, I love this idea. I want to support, but I'm still looking forward to hearing back from him. <laughs> um, yeah, so Mark Ruffalo, and they also have their, um, their project. So we're trying to, trying to combine this efforts and do a joint effort for like a better world that we, we want to see. You know, we know that there is competition. We have all across Africa, the Fairy Collection, Mongo Plus Main, but we know that our, our product is different. Why is it different? Because it's all indigenous managed, and um, it comes from a community, and all the money and proceeds that we are producing are going back to these other projects that I was telling you about. So it's not that we created this to be a um, public company in the future, you know? So we're trying to manage this uh, and grow or, as organically as we can and fund our, the rest of the project. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I wanna go now for, for questions and thank you for coming.
Thanks, Leo. So I have a couple of questions and then we'll open up uh, to the audience. Um, so it was really interesting to get an insight. You're at such an early stage in your company and it's really exciting to see kind of the potential of the impact that you're gonna have. So one question I have for you, we talk a lot about solutions to climate change here at Yale. And recently there's been a lot of discussion about what does entrepreneurship, how does entrepreneurship play into that? So I guess I'm really curious to hear from you as a long time activist <laughs> since the age of 13, um, why did you decide to make this shift to become a social entrepreneur? Um, well, I know you're still doing some of your advocacy work, but it's clear you see a path for impact through business and, and entrepreneurship. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I think the best way to combat you know, climate change is by creating solutions. Yes, we need uh, to do advocacy, but at the end of the day, people in their communities need to eat. And through social innovation or through social entrepreneurship, we can find, we can bridge this gap between what are the communities doing and what is like the capitalism work doing. And, 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 we've, and if we bridge this gap and connect this to uh, the communities and the, and the market, then we can find a solution for them to stay in their communities and protect their their lands and territories, and also being part of like the, the global civil society. And I think social innovation should, should be this bridge in between, because we're not gonna get rid from capitalism. So how can we work with towards this effort of building this new society? And there are, diff there are different ways of doing this. Like we, we need to start talking about like this, this alternative, these solutions, because at the end of the day, we need to do something. You know, it's not like a lot of people say, yeah, you're not an activist anymore. I am an activist, but I am doing this through a um, more tangible approach. And I'm not saying that doing advocacy is, is bad, but doing advocacy together with a tangible solution that you can create jobs and people can send their kids to school and, and, and have money to buy food or eat. I think that's the basic principle. That's great. Um, another thing we talk about a lot here is, you know, still I think when you hear the word entrepreneur, for a lot of people that brings up, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, a white male in a hoodie staying up till two in the morning in his dorm room creating the next unicorn company. And one of the things that Bright Lights Green Sites has done is brought an incredible set of diverse entrepreneurs to campus to talk about their endeavors. And I think one thing that comes up for a lot of our students is um, the tension of where can you create the most impact in terms of where your home is? So we've had some people that have come to campus and said, you know what, you need to be turning back to your own communities and really creating impact there. Um, but I think that's a struggle for a lot of people, especially if they come from more rural areas. So as someone who's traveled all over the world but grew up in a very rural part and has now gone back to those communities, can you talk a little bit about that tension and how you've kind of balanced having you know, a global impact on working on different issues with that need to go home and really create impact in your own community? I think, like, yeah, like, I think creating an impact, I think we all should, like, there are, like, different things, you know, there are different stage of, uh, stages and ways to create impact. But um, we should start locally to bring a global perspective towards this new generation, this new, this new um, active civil society. So being an activist, I used to like give talks in colleges more about like climate change and the, um, and, the, and what oil companies have done in, in Ecuador and like the corruption and all of that, just giving them perspective of like, oh, we need to be an activist. And a lot of people will say, oh, I want to come to the Amazon. You know, I'm like, you don't need to travel like 3,000 miles to help save the world. It's not that you're gonna save the Amazon if you come to the Amazon. We should start, you should start thinking about yourself as an individual, like what am I gonna do? You know, what am I gonna do with myself as an individual to fight for this world or, or to take action? This is what people say here. We need to take action, but you need to start taking action at your homes, with, uh, with your family, with your friends, with your local communities. 
And if we, as, if, if we start with our local communities, then we can all become a global civil society movement. And the same thing with the entrepreneurship world. Like, yes, I have been traveling. I was like, okay, I've, I've been traveling. I got educated. But how can I give back to my community? Because I was given this platform. You know, I was given this platform as an indigenous person, like growing up, sort of like I grew up in the Amazon and then I moved to the city. I was like, okay, how can I, I use this platform that uh, through education I can get other funds, other resources, other other um, support for my community. So I, I, I see it like going from like from a small to big and then being um, more organically, like going down back and forth. But the best way is when we start doing something. You know, if you start, if you want to do it big and you want to do it through like a tech or, or tech company or like whatever, if you want to go from big, like as long as everybody start doing from from like what they see fit in their lives, as long as it is uh, organic, you know, or, like organically, like it becomes organically, you should start doing it because there is no, there is there is not the right way to do it as long as you do it. So if you don't start doing it, then nobody's going to do it for you. All right, I have one last question, and then we'll go out to the audience. Um, so I've seen you personally transition through so many different types of audience, right? You can you stand up in your local community. You give talks and interact with Leonardo DiCaprio at the climate march. You, you kind of have been involved in a lot of like high-level investment with some of the past companies you've worked with. What's the hardest part for that about you, moving through all those different worlds? And how do you stay true to who you are when you're doing that? Oh, uh, it is crazy. It is crazy going back and forth from the community uh, and like to this other spaces. But as long as you treat it with respect, you know, like you treat it with respect and then and as a learning experience, I think you can get the best of the of the worlds, you know, like um, I've been in crazy spaces in the Amazon, and then I, I'm in New York, like talking to Leo DiCaprio, and then I'm not gonna go back to my community and say like, oh, like I'm I'm doing all of this. No, you you, you sort of like go back with respect for the places that you are. It really has changed. It, it has given me a a broader perspective on uh, of how do I want to be in the world and how I want to approach like the next project like I work with different uh, I work with nonprofit com uh, from nonprofit NGOs and then I work for companies and then I work with the government so it's, how can I learn and bridge those gaps to um, to connect the dots you know for me I see myself as a person that is trying to be the bridge for this world and these gaps and like use my perspective of what I've learned for a better use, for a better understanding and me helping out the community and the community helping out the, the work that we're doing for this planet and for myself. That's great. All right, questions from the audience. Yeah. Can you um, press the button and introduce yourself, name, where you're from, there's little microphones in front of you. We're live streaming, so thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ines, I'm from Peru. Uh, so we have like the same issues that you have in Ecuador. So I have two questions. Like the first one is, what type of organization is HACO? Is it nonprofit? Is it for profit? Um, and the second question is, um, how do you give back to these women? Are they your suppliers? Do you pay them like a commission for the pieces that they sell, or do you, do they receive a, a steady like salary? Like, sueldo, salary. Um, I don't know. Like, how do you give back? to those women. So, yeah. yeah, the um, w uh, the organization. Uh, the Haku Project is a nonprofit organization. So um, as I said before, the, the Haku Project is a nonprofit organization that works in four different things. So we work on education, uh, health, community-based alternative projects, and uh, advocacy. So under the, the Haku Project, we, we have Haku Amazon Design. That is a for-profit, it's a company. But the nonprofit is on top of that. And with the Haku Amazon design, 
we, uh, we have built in in a way that will sponsor the other projects, like the, the investment that will come in for the company will be invested in. Other projects that, such as Hacko Amazon Design, let's say another community has chocolate or they're doing other type of projects. So Hacko Amazon Design will invest in those projects and help the communities. And we're doing, um, we're doing the, um, for the payment of the of the women, we, we we're using the fair trade. You know, like you buy them on site, you you give capacity, then you buy it on site, and then we created the Haku Women's Association, and then the, uh, after you sell the product, the like part of the proceeds will go to the Haku Association, and the other uh, part will go to the Haku project to invest in the in the in the other programs that we have. So we, we, we do it like the women get paid directly, like one-time payment, and then they will get a, a, another percentage from the company that can be used as they want. And we have created different uh, women's associations. So we work with one community, so that is the Serena Women's Association, the San Jacinto Women's Association, and then they, they have their, their say. And they're part of the company, and they're part of like the board and, and towards decision making on the projects that we want to go forward. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Maki and I'm from Ecuador, Peru, um, and I've done some work with alternative livelihoods with indigenous groups. You mentioned um, the other kind of groups and co-ops that do similar things as, as your competition. But in terms of capacity building and supporting alternative livelihoods, have you explored partnerships, either existing or new, with these other groups and co-ops around kind of building those things out with these communities? Um, I didn't really understand because like, you're talking about like other big companies that I show on the, on the slide. Because as Haku Amazon Design, we're using this as an alternative, as in a platform, I say. Like the, the platform, like the online platform. So we're starting with this, but in Ecuador there are other existing companies like the, the chocolate from the Warani woman. The, there is another co-op that is producing Wayusa in like in Napo, they're just they're, they're like community managed and they're just starting and they need market access. So we want to use this platform for for to, to support them so they can sell through this platform and if they don't have that. And um, we haven't really spoke to like other bigger companies because we're not at that stage now. We're more at the stage where we want to support other community-based projects like locally, then already start like thinking about like Costco or fair trade collection or or other companies. Um, so my question is more about you mentioned that you're doing capacity building activities with them. So I'm, I'm wondering, I guess specifically, like what those are, and if you're partnering with other groups to do those capacity building. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, like we do like the the um, the handcrafts, but we also do education. We do advocacy. We do um, health. Like uh, we have a program with women. So all of these projects are already in place by a community. For example, a lot of these projects we're doing at my my co-founders community Sarayaku, and they have already in place. So we're not doing it ourselves. We're just supporting them or getting funding. Uh, mostly getting funding for them because you need to act where you already know, like what's your expertise. We're not, I'm not going to be giving like a women's workshop, but we we um, we make um, uh, alliances with with other already in place projects that we will support in different ways. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm also Ecuadorian. Uh, thank you, Leo, for coming today. Uh, it was uh, it was a remar remarkable presentation what you have did. Uh, my question goes to: uh, Given that Ecuador is a, is a country that depends uh, about 30 to 40 percent on oil and gas as uh, his main income, um, what do you think? What do you think has been the role of the government uh, nowadays and in the last couple of, uh, of years in terms of uh, tr trying to? Uh, tr trying to preserve uh, natural environments and uh, and, and climate and uh, combating climate change in, in, in this sense. 
Uh, have you felt a, a new tendency that the Ecuadorian government ha have been putting more resources and efforts to, to combat this? Uh, personally, as an activist, I don't think they have done anything to promote uh, sustainable living in the Ecuadorian Amazon or, or like to work towards the communities. Um, the last government that we had it started as a very progressive government saying like, oh, we're going to keep the oil on the ground and start like the Yasuni ITT initiative and we want money from the world. And be, uh, and they didn't do it. They, pull, they pulled the plug on the Yasuni Initiative, which was one of the most renowned things for the Ecuadorian government last year. But they, at the same time, they said, OK, before pu pulling the plug on the Yasuni ITT Initiative, they already um, uh, put out on, on beating uh, 21 oil blocks in the central cell of the Ecuadorian Amazon. You know, like, since uh, you already mentioned, yeah, the Ecuadorian government depends on the fossil fuel industry, and they're not doing any other thing to promote sustainable alternatives like energy solutions. You know, they, they don't really have a, an in-place program. Instead of, uh, like, the last, go the last Ecuadorian government in prison, uh, much more um, indigenous leaders, uh, environmentalists than any other government in previous years. So they had their rhetoric, but they didn't actually in place any program or anything that will, they, they, they started working with um, um, Socio Bosque, which is a, a red sort of, uh, you know, red plus? I don't know, you know, red plus. So it's a sort of red Ecuadorian in place. And through doing that, you know, they, they started going through to the community to say, okay, we'll pay if you do this much conservation. And while they had the chance to enter the, these communities, they will start bringing in the, the oil companies. They say, like, okay, we're doing consultation now. Because the communities didn't let them uh, come in to their territories. And they say, oh, we have this, we have money for you to do conservation, preservation. And then right after that, we'll say, oh, we'll give you this money from like Socio Bosque if you allow us to come with extraction or. So it, it was like in, in paper, Ecuadorians seem very green, but at the end of the day, the government like started doing open mining for the first time. We didn't have mining, uh, open mining pits in Ecuador before, and now it's all uh, bid out to the Chinese companies. And then we didn't have this. Um, the Ecuadorian um, oil industry was based in the northern part of, uh, of the Ecuadorian Amazon. So they started expanding the oil frontier to the central south, from, from, to the center where I'm from, and more to the central south, even if the, the oil was heavy. It's heavy oil, and a lot of this is due, it's not because it's even worth for the Ecuadorian government drilling, it is worth for the, the um, business circles or the politicians that are around the pipelines, around the, um, the, the construction, around the platforms, around the everything that, the oil services, the oil services industry. So um, yeah, they, 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 they didn't really help at, at all to the indigenous communities. We just got a new president of, uh, in Ecuador, you know. He, uh, he started his, uh, his period in um, May. So now he's saying, I'm going to talk to the communities. I'm going to establish dialogue with the, the indigenous people. I'm, I, uh, I want to put the, the Yasuni question on the national referendum that they want to do now. But I, as, as a, my activist point is that our work doesn't stop there. Because th this is how the last government started. He said, "Like, oh, I'm like, I'm gonna be like the greenest government regime in in Ecuador," and then they screwed us over. So with this one, we're we're, ten ca we're still taking cautious. Uh, we're very cautious about like this new, this new president, and we're still doing our like field work with the communities towards stopping like the expansion of the oil frontier of mining in the in the in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Yeah. Hola, Leo. Hi, I'm Julio, also from Ecuador. I know Leo for a few years ago. Uh, my question is, because uh, you know in Ecuador we have a lot of different indigenous communities. So how would you see them? I mean, will they be rivals, or will you be maybe willing to 
invite them to join your project or maybe train them to follow the same experience you had? Because you know all, all our indigenous people are facing a lot of a struggle these days, especially those facing pollution. So have you given any thoughts about them if they want to follow you or <coughs> maybe compete with you? Yeah, um, we definitely want to be, we want to expand our work as much as, I, as we can. But the problem is that we don't have, as a company, we're very, uh, we're very small and we don't have the capacity of the market access to already be in that position where we can work. Well, if, if, if it was for me, I could, I, I, my projection is to work with the eight Amazonian countries and with all the indigenous communities. But realistically, you have to grow as you have the meanings to grow. You know, so we started in Napo with some communities. We just started doing uh, another, uh, we started working with another community in the Yasuni National Park. So we're working with communities that invite us to work with them or, or they want to learn the technique. You know, we, we want to say like, we want to learn the technique or we want to do the, the beading work, or like help us with your designs. We're saying like, yes, do it. You know, like for example, there is Sunny Isla. Sunny Isla is a community that has a, a hotel in the Yasuni National Park. So they said like, come, like teach us. I was like, I'll come and teach you and you can do these handcrafts. You know, you have to do like the same quality and materials and, and designs, but you can sell it at your local lodge. We're not, we're not taking like any money from that. But if you have the market right there in your community, do it. You know, we want to do it. And we also, with, I said that we work with 200 women, but these 200 women know how to do this and they can do other designs they can do and they can sell in their communities. You know, but what we are trying to do is that if we teach them like this technique and all of this, we want to be able to buy from them and, and, uh, and keep uh, taking orders to them, you know, like so they can have more um, uh, income, you know, like, uh, but like a steady, a steady income instead of like having one order every like two months or three months because otherwise it's not going to be worth it. But the idea is, yes, we want to expand and work with as many indigenous nations that we can and as many communities as we can. So that's why we're looking forward to like new projects. We know like the handcrafts is not, we don't have a big market yet, but let's say Leo DiCaprio gives us like $500,000 or $1 million. Then we will have the capacity to expand the work in the Amazon as well as, as expand our markets, like, you know, like in, in, in the US and in Europe. So. That's the idea. As long as we, get, uh, we can get those resources, we will reinvest those resources in the Amazon. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chloe um, from the US. I'm curious as to why you chose jewelry as your product as opposed to other handmade um, crafts and also where you, what the materials are used to make it and where they come from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, chose, <laughs> we chose jewelry because uh, in Ecuador we go out to a lot of demonstrations and marches, and I, I, I was working for Amazon Watch. It's a local, it's not a local, it's, it's a nonprofit that works on, on um, protecting the Amazon rainforest. So I used to do advocacy work with them and like demonstrations and work around um, indigenous issues. So um, a lot of the times, the women from the communities that will come to Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador, to do a demonstration, they will bring in their jewelry, like their design, so they can sell it during the march or they can sell it somewhere and then they will have money for the bus or food or all of this. So every time, and I've been working with a lot of these women, like the, a lot of the women that we work, they're like human rights defenders and like, like this hardcore indigenous women that comes to the marches and they sell the handcrafts. And a lot of the time we're saying like, Leo, please help us uh, sell the, the handcrafts. Like you travel to the US, can you just bring this package and like sell it wh wherever you are? So I was like, oh, interesting. There, this will be, for me, that was, the, like, that, that was the starting point. I was like, okay, what if I can make it happen that they can sell online or they can do other type of colors and designs. So this is how it started. But we don't wanna um, 
stay there. You know, we want to go into clothing. We want to go into like different, like support other projects that people have. We have coming up a clothing collection. Um, uh, Beyonce's fashion designer came to one of our talks of Haku. And then he's like very interested in creating a line with beading well, for Haku for clothing. So we're like exploring different ideas and how we want to grow and how do we want to grow organically, you know? And um, that's the that's the that's our starting point. Yes. Um so who are you from? Sorry. Um I'm microphone. Hi, I'm Billy Marks. I'm a second year MBA candidate here at SOM. Um, thanks so much. This is super fascinating. Um, and I love what you're doing. I'm curious because about jewelry and like intellectual property, and particularly we're working with indigenous communities, a lot of artistry and artisanship is related to like cultural heritage. So I'm curious, and like designs, and there's a huge um, intellectual property case related to um, Quiche, Mayan artistry in Guatemala, where I was working this past summer. So I'm curious how you, A, like um, support and protect and represent your um, artisans, and specifically give them representation in the design and the, the direction of the company. And then more specifically, how are you reconciling things like wanting to work with Leonardo DiCaprio or Beyonce when there might be like an appropriative aspect of artisanship from these indigenous communities. Yeah, the, that's why we created our own line. We didn't, um, the communities have their own designs, their, their own art. So when we created the Haku line, I was like, even though we all like, everybody that is working in, in Haku is indigenous, like Nina, all of us, you know, like, but we don't wanna appropriate stuff from our culture Either, 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 either way, you know. So all of these designs are new designs. These are not the designs that the community's been using. So we, the, um, when we first started, the only thing that, like the, the first time that we said, like, let's not copy what they have. You know, let's create our own designs. So we will not have this kind of projects, uh, this kind of uh, problems. We, like, we, we've been hearing about what's going on in Guatemala and what happened to the, the, those designs and now the community is suing them. But yeah, that's, that's why we, decided, we, we worked with, um, the, we hired three designers to work with the, the women and create new things that don't have to be, uh, so we don't culturally appropriate something that they had previously. So don't copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for sharing your time with us today. My question relates to, um, in, oh, my name's Leah. <laughs> I'm a first year at School of Forestry. Um, and I'm wondering if you've thought about engaging men in your efforts and providing opportunities for economic mobility for men in education. And if not, um, why not? And also preface this by saying I'm all about girl power and female <laughs> empowerment, but um, they're a part of the community too. So just yeah, um, if you go on our Instagram today, you will see uh, uh, this is the first picture that we post of a man doing uh, the beating work. We, uh, for obvious reasons, we decided to uh, start working with the women because they are like the new, like the center of, of an indigenous family, and they like carry on the culture, they carry on the work, they do, and they are better with money. Also, <laughs> so we decided to work like a start with that, and we we didn't work with men because we didn't like um, the we didn't know what to do like uh, um, and we didn't have their resources. So we wanted to start with something that we knew and that we could integrate the women. But right now, if you see like a lot of the workshops that we do with the women, the men are helping them. You know, the men are helping them. They're, they're helping them, like, like, I don't know, do the beating. They're, like, much, much, much faster. And, and, and it's, it has changed a little bit of the relationships in the communities because now these women are, like, the ones who are bringing the income, you know? It's like, and the men are saying, oh, Leo, you know, I want to do that. I know, it's like, like, I can do that much faster than my, uh, than my wife. <laughs> but at the end of the day, 
we, we would love to integrate them in and something, because the idea is that we want to create sustainable communities. You know, we want to create sustainable communities. We want to do like, um, como se dice baños secos? Oh, like dry toilets. Dry toilets. We want to do. Plastic toilets. Um, we want to do, we want to create like a sustainable community. So, and in a sustainable community, we want to integrate men. For example, like my family, I am from Tena, close to Tena. My, my father is from a, like a small indigenous community. And, it's, and, and now like my, my goal in life is like, I want to create the first like sustainable indigenous community I want to have like, I want to have like Haku Amazon design, and I want to have like the the dry toilets there. I want to have like permaculture. I want to see like how that will evolve in like different projects. Right now, the Haku project doesn't have the money to like do all of that or work with men, women, and all of them. But we're starting at some point, and we will consider at uh, you know, uh, in the next stages integrating the men, and because right now, for example. There is a university in Quito, and a lot of the women have like these uh, students that are um, are um, finishing high school, uh, and they are going to the um, to university. And there is like like the best university of Ecuador, it's in Quito, and they give scholarships out to to students. And and Nina and I said like, why don't we start fundraising for these kids from like the communities that are, uh, from the women that are part of the Haku. Let's start fundraising for their, like, so we can give them scholarships to go to school, and when they finish, they can work like a year or two for Haku, and then we'll see if they, we can generate that. So we think about different possibilities in which this project can become self-sustainable in the long run, because we don't want to be like the, the typical nonprofit NGO projects that come and do like one work and they run out of money and they leave the country or they just don't do anything else. So we're just thinking about like different ways and in which we can become self-sustainable. One last question. You already asked one, so <laughs> can you press the button and say who you are? Oh. Hi, I'm Yannick, Yale graduate, originally from Haiti and then New York City. Uh, do you have electricity in your area where you live, where the communities are, and if so, where do you get it from? Um, depends on the community. We work with several communities. Like 80%, uh, we don't have electricity. The, you only have electricity in the communities that are closer to a city. You get from like the, um, the, the power plants are uh, hydroelectrics in Ecuador. And you get it from there, from them, like the, the communities that are closer to the cities. But communities such as Sarayaku, they, they, they don't have electricity at all. So they run on gas, no, not, not like gas, come see, gasolina, fuel, on fuel, mm -hmm. or solar power, or none at all. So, yeah. All right, well, Leo, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think we're all excited to see where HACO is going to go next. Um, and just a couple of quick things. So Bright Lights, Green Sites has a new coordinator, which is Victoria. This is her first session. And so if anyone has questions about the series or ideas of speakers that you want to see, definitely recommend talking to her. Um, and if anyone is really interested in buying any of this jewelry, I know that's also a possibility. So if anyone's excited about that, you can chat to Leo after. Um, but thank you, Leo, for sharing your story. And um, it's really going to be exciting to see where your journey takes you next. Thank you. Yeah.